The idea today is to talk a little bit about the economy in Brazil, the labor market, and minimum wage, the, the policy for minimum wage in the country, and how it is related to the, to the income distribution movement. Because we had in the last 10 or 15 or maybe even 20 years, a movement of improvement of, uh, of income distribution in Brazil. And at the same time, in the last 10, 15 years, we have this, uh, this policy uh, toward the minimum wage that uh, is related to the increase of minimum wage in the country. This is a national policy for the increase of minimum wage. So I will try to relate the minimum wage policy to income distribution in Brazil. But before, I will give you a few, a few information about the economy and labor market. This is the structure of the conference. First, some remarks on the behavior of the economy from the, two the years 2000. Uh, some labor mar market analysis using the official statistical, uh, statistical source from IBGE, the Brazilian Institute, the very known IBGE in Brazil. I pro I, I, when I discuss the, the, the labor market, I will propose you this idea of a synthetic index to analyze the labor market, just for a very short uh, presentation for this. Then I will talk uh, about the minimum wage policy, and uh, I will try to give two, two, two studies, two papers in which I, I try to, to estimate the role uh, of minimum wage to, to improve the uh, distribution, income distribution in Brazil. And finally, uh, a short discussion about what should be, what will be in the future uh, the policy for minimum wage. Okay. Then, it's uh, here. First, uh, political chronology, just to have an idea uh, what happened in Brazil since 2002. We had the election of President Lula. I, I think it, most of you know who Lula was. Uh, he is uh, uh, the leader, metallurgical leader of the Workers' Party. He was elected in 2002. And then we had from 2003 to 2006, his first government, Lula won, and the creation of Bolsa Familia program. And then we had the Lula II government, the second one from 2007 to 2010. Then uh, uh, his successor was Dilma, uh, that was chosen by him, and, and then she was uh, the president from 2011 to 2014. And then the second Dilma govern government, in which we had th this impeachment in the middle of, of, of uh, the, his, her mandate. And so uh, it, it lasts just an idea and a half. And then from then on, we have this President Temer that was her vice president, and he took power. He participated in this impeachment movement to get, get, to get rid of her. And then he is there until now. And uh, next uh, Sunday, next Sunday, just next Sunday, we will have the second, two, the second round of the presidential elections in Brazil. And uh, there, there are two candidates for the second round. Uh, one that is supported by Lula, that is in prison right now. And the other one that is extreme right, completely right-wing candidate that probably will win the elections. So that's uh, what's happening right now in Brazil. Well, <laughs> let's continue. This is the, you know, just in a few words, the evolution of the economy over the past 15 years. We had a strong growth between 2004 and 2008, five years of growth, that was favored by the international economy and the growth of the domestic market. That uh, in that period we had like around 5% growth of the GDP, so it's a strong. Huh? And then uh, we suffered the negative effects on the economy in 2009. That's related to the, the international crisis, of course. And then we had just the, in the year 2010 a strong recovery that was driven by fiscal and credit policies implemented 
to promote production and consumption in Brazil, and we had 7.5. Wow, how it had 7.5 growth in that year, but you know, just one year, and then it, it started this economic slowdown from 2011 up to 2014. Uh, and uh, in this period, we had a, a huge increase in the budget deficit. I will discuss this just after. And uh, in 2015 and 2016, we had this deep crisis in Brazil. Uh, I am going to show you the figures. And uh, we have, right now, a very low uh, recovery in, uh, in the economy. Well, then this is the, those are the, the figures for, for the GDP in this period. And this is a, a very favorable period from here to here. Lula, first Lula and second Lula in this period. Then the 2009 result from the international uh, crisis in Brazil. And this is a 7.5 growth. And this is the, the deceleration period Already with Dilma, Dilma won, and this is what happened 2015, 2016, and the, the recovery of 1% last year, and maybe another 1% this year. So this is what happened to the GDP. And I, I have some figures for you, just to have an idea of inflation rate. Uh, inflation rate, we have this program to, to fix the maximum value for the inflation rate in Brazil. It's usually uh, the, the, the program uh, inflation rates of 4.5%. That's uh, the official. And you should not uh, have more two, two points more or two points less uh, percentage out of this value. And, but you see, uh, inflation rate was, uh, most of the time, it was close to the, the top expected value, 6.5%. And then we had this year, this is a special year because it was the first Dilma II government year. And so there, there we had some adjustments in, in price, in official and administrative, administrated price. And now with the, the, the crisis, the, the economic crisis, inflation went down. So just to have an idea on inflation in the country. Uh, I mentioned the fiscal crisis. So you see here, uh, this is primary, primary surplus or deficit, the primary without considering interest, the, the payment of interest. When you consider the payment of interest, you put together, this is the nominal, 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 uh, nominal uh, deficit, nominal deficit, nominal deficit, uh, it, it, it went down to 10% of, 10 of GDP is, is huge, this. But you know, with the, 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 uh, the, cri the crisis, and it went up a little bit, and the, the, the interest rate went down also. But anyway, we have right now a, a primary deficit of almost 2%, 2%, 2 and when you add the payment of interest, it goes to something like 6 7%. So you have to take care of this, because you cannot uh, uh, continue with such a high uh, deficit uh, in the country. <coughs> well, th that's all I have to talk to you about the economy. I don't have much time to continue. Then I, I will talk about what happened, uh, what happened with the labor market in Brazil uh, in, in the last 10-15 uh, years. First, some information about the period. The, 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 the nice period, the period in which the labor market was, was working well. Up to 2014, that means before the, the, the crisis, the Brazilian crisis. That's very clear. This happened for during 10 years, 10, 11 years, and a strong decline in unemployment. This is, is it's so much, you know, it went down from 12 to 6%, for instance, yeah. unemployment rate. So it's really a strong decline. And uh, at the same time, with the, this national policy for minimum wage, we had a significant growth of minimum wage. Minimum wage is in the base uh, of uh, the revenue in labor market. 
So if minimum wage is, is growing, at the same time we have the, uh, the average labor er earnings growing together. They, go, they grow at, at not at the same rate, but they have the same, same trend of growth. And this is another point, very important. Uh, we had a large formal uh, job creation in this period. And so a, a strong reduction of informality in the labor market in Brazil. In countries like Brazil, we have a very a huge informality in the, re the relationship in the labor market. Um, maybe half of the population have no formal contracts. So informality is really important. And informality decreased a lot in this period. And at the same time, <coughs> we had this substantial improvement in the dis uh, income distribution uh, not in general, income distribution in general, and income distribution in the labor market, the labor, labor income. Labor income improved the distribution of labor income among workers, and in the population as a whole, uh, the, labor, uh, the income distribution I improved uh, in this period, up to 2014, I'm talking. This is just, just to give to some uh, information about the creation of formal jobs. It's impressive because, you know, you had like 1.5 million formal, new formal jobs every year from 2004 to 2008. Then 2000, 2009 was a, a, a bad year for Brazil. But even so, even though we had some creation of 1 million a formal, not informal, formal employment. And then this is a 2.5 growth rate, so 2.5 million new uh, formal jobs. But with the deceleration of the economy, uh, the creation of uh, new formal jobs uh, decreased uh, up to 2004, 14, and then the crisis is the destruction, destruction of uh, formal jobs, 1.5 million, 1.5 million, that means around 3 million jobs, formal jobs, finished in this period. It, in 2000, this is, that means zero, no creation at all, but no destruction in 2017. Uh, okay, those are the good news. Now I am discuss the recent period. And the recent period means because I'm changing the information. Before I was using uh, PNAD and uh, HIS. And now I am, I am using the new PNAD data, the new, the new uh, data from uh, IBGE. They changed completely the, the, the form of obtaining the data. So uh, I'm using this new data to analyze this period from 2012 on. So they, they are quarterly data instead of annual data. First, what happened to, I showed you the GDP decrease and uh, what happened uh, comparing yearly data. But now I'm comparing quarterly data and I'm comparing one quarter to the same quarter in the year before. So you see, the rate of increase for the, the, the GDP was around 2 to 4 percent up to this point. That means the starting of 2014. The start of 2014, we had growth in, in, in the country. But then we had this decrease, decrease up to this point, the end of 2015, in, in when you had almost 6 percent decrease in the GDP when compared to the last quarter of 2014, 2015 to 2014. And then it's still a decrease, but uh, in, in, uh, in the beginning of 2017, uh, we had zero growth compared to the year before. And from then on, we have some growth. It's not uh, huge, but you know, there is some recovery in the economy. And then uh, we have this between 0 and 2% increase. This is uh, the first, second quarter of this year. The last data I, I show you, who, you here for the GDP data. 
This is not, of course, this is not PNAD data. This is, uh, is uh, national accounts data, but uh, quarterly national accounts data. Well, to analyze, uh, to continue the analysis of the labor market in Brazil, I will use three main variables, three, three variables, three important variables. I think no one is against using unemployment rate because unemployment rate is basic yeah, to, 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 to study labor market. And also average uh, real labor, the average wage in the economy. The third one, the third variable, is typical from countries like Brazil in which the informal sector is very important. So I will use the, this third data, formality rate, percentage of workers that have a formal contract. What happened uh, with the formality rate uh, in Brazil? So I will try to analyze uh, uh, the formal market using those three important variables for the, for the labor market. What happened to unemployment rate in this period, 2012 to 2018? It's very clear. A huge increase in the unemployment rate. From 6.5 in the beginning, this beginning of 2015, to what? 13.5 is more, more than double, a little bit more than double in just, what, one year and a half. So you can imagine the, the force of the, the crisis on the labor market during just one year and a half. And from, from there on, it's decreasing slowly. It's decreasing. The movement is decreasing. Uh, another thing interesting here is this seasonal movement that you find in the interior of each year. You have an increase in the beginning. This is typical of the, 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 the Brazilian economy. In the beginning of the year, uh, unemployment increase and then goes down. Increase and goes down. And you find this every year. But until this year, you, 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 2014, you found it. But from 2015 on, until uh, 2017, during this, those two years, no seasonal, no clear seasonal movement anymore, just an increase of unemployment rate. And from 2016, 2017 on, it is the same movement again, but with a rate that's two eyes higher than it was before. So it's the, the normal situation now, that was the normal situation before the crisis. So is the uh, 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 unemployment rate. Income, average income. You see that uh, the crisis didn't touch that much the average, the average income for people employed, of course, because those that lost their employment, they have zero income. But anyway, uh, it was increasing, increasing, then, you know, sort of stable in 2014, decreased during the, 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 the crisis, and the now is decreasing again. So if you compare the situation now with the situation in 2012, it's an improvement. Yes? <laughs> of course, it's the, right now it's like, 4.55 five five, uh, reais by euro. But you have to, to uh, use the power par parity purchase, power parity. Yeah, and of course, uh, if you consider, for instance, the minimum wage in Brazil now is like 200 euros, more or less, if you use the change rate. But the, the purchase power is, is higher. But I don't know, I cannot tell you how higher it is. Unless you, someone has a disparity power uh, rate uh, to make the correction. But anyway, just divide by five, you have an idea of the average labor income in the country. But uh, I would say that uh, this growth here is related in some way to the inflation. 
you remember the, the graphic I showed you before, deflation went very, went very high, decreased a lot uh, in the, those last few years. So it uh, helped uh, to compensate in some way uh, uh, the, the, labor, the, in, the average income labor. But anyway, the results on the labor income are not uh, bad as I would expect when you see the intensity of the crisis and of the unemployment rate, the increase of unemployment rate. But the, the, third, the third data, the, the percentage of formal employees, employees, this is very bad, yeah? because it's going down, 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 and no, no sign of, no, no sign of recuperation until now. And this, this means that 40% of the whole population in Brazil were uh, people uh, in the formal uh, sector, in the formal private sector. That, that, that's, that's the data. I'm not considering here the, the government employees and so on, but I'm just considering the private sector. And what I show you is an increase in the informal employment and then a decrease that continues until now. I, I think the, the next uh, data here is still worse. I just have it at, uh, in July. July is the last month here, but August is still worse than that. So those are the three main statistics I use to uh, analyze the uh, labor market in Brazil. And then I propose with those three variables to create uh, a summary index. Uh, condensed index for the labor market. Just choose the variables, those three, standard, standardize the, the variables, like uh, uh, a monetary uh, variable should be transformed into something comparable to a, a rate variable. So it's very easy to do this. It's just uh, transform it in values zero, one. One good, zero bad. And then you add them up and take the average and you can uh, produce an index. This is not new, this is, just, this is inspired by the UN Human Development Index. You, you all should know it. And then when it, it's a variable like, uh, like uh, formal employment uh, or income, for instance, use this formula. The income in that, that uh, year, that month, compared to the lowest income and divide by the difference between the highest and the lowest income. Then you transform income in an index between zero and one. Uh, it, it's good when you are close to the maximum. It gives the value one when you divide. And if you are close to the minimum value, that means a zero index. That's bad. So it's, you use this for formality, you use this for uh, income, and you use this for unemployment, because un high unemployment is bad in a bad situation. So you just uh, make an, an inversion in the formula. And when you are in the uh, lowest, lowest, uh, lowest uh, in unemployment rate, you have here the same value as here. So it's value 1 in the lowest case. When you have the highest, an unemployment rate, you have uh, the value zero. So you have values for the three, the three variables between zero and one. You add them up, divide by three, for instance. If you, uh, if you think that one variable is more important, you just make the, the average y y you want. But in the case, I just had this average, the average, uh, the regular average, and here's is what my labor market summary index showed to us. The improvement up to, ah, the values are between zero and one. So uh, improvement up to the, the beginning of 2014, then a sort of fluctuation. And then this is the period of uh, the, the high, the high uh, crisis. But from the middle of 2016 on, you have a sort of a new fluctuation uh, uh, around values that much lower than there, 
there it was around 0.8, and here is around 0.4, 0.3. So it's a, a situation that's mm -hmm. much worse than it was uh, before the crisis. So this is just uh, an idea of summarize the labor market using uh, an index based on three variables. Uh, I, I mentioned at the end in my, in my bibliography uh, one paper uh, that I wrote with my colleague Lucia Kubrusli is in Portuguese, unfortunately, but it's mentioned there that's the how we develop this methodology and there are there is another methodology used there. But if you prefer, you can look uh, each year, 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, etc. And right now, if you see, in July of this year, uh, the index shows practically the same value that it, uh, it showed last year and the year before. That means in the last few years, you have just a fluctuation of this index that gives us an idea of uh, the labor market in Brazil. No improvements, just uh, the same value as two years ago. I mean, 2016, 17, 18, are those decreasing and they are in the same, the same situation. Well, how much time do I have? A lot of time. That's it? Maybe more, more. <laughs> we can negotiate, huh? Okay, because this is important. Yeah, our style. Uh, now I'm going to talk you uh, to talk about the minimum wage policy and how it is related to income distribution. First, the importance of minimum wage in Brazil. A few points. First, uh, minimum wage in Brazil was created in, 19, in 1940. That means a long, long time ago, we have this national policy for minimum wage. Uh, the current value is this one that, that I mentioned, around 200 euros. Minimum wage uh, is received by people in the base of the labor market, the formal labor, formal labor market, but because in the labor market, uh, uh, enterprise have to pay at least one minimum wage to workers. So is the, the base, the floor of uh, revenue in the minimum, in the labor market. It is received by around 9 million people in the labor market in Brazil receives exactly one minimum wage. And is the minimum value paid to, to the national social security pensions. The national social security pension starts from one minimum wage on, one minimum wage on, and most people receive exactly one minimum wage in this national social security pension system. Uh, it's also the value that's paid by BPC. BPC is a social assistance benefit in Brazil that is received by four million people, older or people with the disabilities in poor families. If you are a person with disability or old in families considered very poor. Very poor means one-fourth of minimum wage per capita. Then you have the right to receive uh, one, one minimum wage. And also is the minimum, minimum amount of unemployment insurance. People in the, in the formal labor market, they have the right to receive uh, this, uh, this benefit. The, the unemployment uh, uh, help, uh, help uh, unemployment insurance, and the minimum value is also minimum wage. So you see that minimum wage is all over, in the country, not only in labor market, but also in the, in the social benefits. And this is a calculation that means that 1% increase in, in real minimum wage represents an increase of public expenditure of about 3.8 billion Reais, that means 800 million euros. Just to have an idea how important is minimum wage for the public expense. And what is the current minimum wage policy in Brazil? This is uh, as described in, in this paper. Uh, well, the minimum wage law is from 2011. 
but it has been used informally even before, from 19, uh, to, no, 19, no, to 2007, uh, uh, the negotiations, the national negotiations for the new value of minimum wage used uh, already this, uh, this, law, this law informally. Uh, what is it? Uh, you have, uh, in January, in January of every year, you have a, a change in the value of minimum wage that's calculated adding the DGP growth of two years ago, two years before, why? Because we don't have the calculation of the, the uh, GDP growth of last year. In January, you don't have it yet. So use the, the GDP growth of two years before and add this to, to the new value of minimum wage. And at the same time, you add, where is it? Where is it? Uh, uh, you add this correction of the consumer price. That means you have the correction by the consumer's price and you add the GDP growth rate of two years before. And then this is the new value of minimum wage in every, in every January of every year. This is the law, that, the, this law that's uh, valid now. And um, this legislation is, it will be valid until the next, the next uh, value for minimum wage in, in next January. Uh, and of course, the new government will have to decide what to do with this law. And this is a big question, what to do with the law of minimum wage. Uh, this legislation is criticized from the p fiscal point of view since the minimum wage represents the floor of social security benefits, etc. Well, I just show you. So an increase in minimum wage means uh, an increase uh, in, in public spending. So people are worried about this because of the fiscal situation of the country. But on the other hand, minimum wage favored the improvement of income distribution as it is recognized by many colleagues, many papers, and I will try to, to convince you that this is true, showing you some, some exercise uh, right now. So this is real minimum wage from 2000. I, I started here to, to uh, 19, uh, 1995 to 2018. That, that means 20, more than 20 years of minimum, minimum wage real values. It is impressive. I think this is really impressive. I don't know of other, uh, other experience in the world in which you had 150% uh, increase in minimum wage in less in around 20 years. From, uh, this is Cardozo government one and two, Lula one and two, Dilma one and two, Dilma Demer two. <coughs> so it's a huge increase in real value of minimum wage in this period. Even before, even before the law, the, the law that we have now that it, uh, shows how it, it is calculated, uh, the, even uh, Cardozo government increased the minimum wage before Lula. It's not just Lula and the, the Workers' Party that uh, ha, ha, had uh, increased minimum wage just before. This is a recognition that minimum wage was very low and that the country had the, the, the possibility, the capacity to increase it uh, in, in, in that period. And this is just a, a short period, 2004 to 2014, to show you minimum wage, real minimum wage, and uh, average uh, labor income. So at the same time that minimum wage went up, of course, uh, labor income, average labor income went up also, together. Although the difference here, the relation here is, is it doesn't show, uh, when you look at this, you see now what difference here is, is smaller than here, but it's not true. If you divide this by this, it's 2.7. If you divide this by, by this, it's 2.7. Three, so the, the relationship between average uh, wage, uh, average uh, labor income, and minimum wage, in some sense, decreased a little bit in this period. Oh no, this is not important. Ah, this is just to show you, 
to show you what happened to income distribution, ma uh, uh, labor income distribution. Here is not family income distribution. I'm talking about labor market. So this is labor income distribution. And the labor income distribution in from 2012 to 2016 uh, improved as measured by Gini index and measured by the relationship between the highest and the lowest uh, uh, average incomes from the 10% to the 40%. The division gives this. So it's the same behavior. It's clear. You can use either Gini or you can use this relationship between average incomes in from the top and the base. It's clear that up to now, we, uh, this is in the middle of the crisis. Huh? This is the first year of the economic crisis. This is the second year. And if you compare those periods, uh, uh, until 2016, you had an improvement in the income distribution of uh, labor income distribution. But 2017 uh, is another situation. It's uh, uh, decreased again, uh, and uh, it got worse, the labor income distribution. I feel sorry, but this is, uh, we could not continue because this decrease, this decrease in Gini index came from years before, from since if you go to 2000, consider 2000 on, the Gini index decreased until now, until here. But now we have, a, uh, it, it seems to, to have a, a new trend. Ah. I will just give you some, the general idea of these uh, simulations. Uh, uh, I try to make some simulations to see uh, the effect of minimum wage on labor income. And the idea here is just to do this. I use the, the notion of elasticity. Everybody should know what elasticity means. And then I calculate the elasticity of the, the dif different incomes of people either in the formal or informal labor market and considering lower, middle, and higher incomes for those people. And uh, I, I relate uh, using data that we have, what happened to these elasticities uh, during, during this period here, 2004 to 2013. Just uh, very simple. What was elasticity for people in the formal market related to, to minimum wage is, is 0.5. 0.5 means that 50% of the increase of minimum wage was transferred for those people. It's 0.9, 90%, and so on. We did, the, we did this for different situations, worker uh, insertion in the labor market. And then uh, I, I calculate, OK, let's use this uh, elasticity and see uh, what would have been the effect of uh, different uh, increased rates for minimum wage on the income dis labor distribution of workers? Just, just an ex exercise. Using the real elasticities and uh, working those elasticities on different uh, in uh, labor income for different situations, uh, what should be the Gini, Gini index, I use Gini index, just considering those elasticities. And then uh, I will compare the, the results of the simulation with the, the real uh, Gini that uh, was measured in 2000, 2013. So it's just uh, an exercise, uh, a simulation, to calculate uh, what would have been the, the role of minimum wage which percentage of the improvement of minimum wage in this period could be related to wh what the, the, the improvement of income distribution in this period sh could be related to the increase of minimum wage. That's the idea. I, can, I know, don't have time, but you know, I have the papers there. If you want, to, you have a look. And then, uh, just to show you as an example, if you consider formal employees, what has been the elasticities for those that received the lowest values in the formal, 
formal sector and those that are in the top. I, I divided by 20s of the income distribution in the, in the formal, uh, formal sector, formal employees. And you see that uh, the elasticity varies, they, they vary a lot from around 1 to something around 0.2. That means that in those cases, the, the people that receive lowest wage in the formal sector, they have all, uh, uh, all transfer of uh, the increase of minimum wage over their, their age because they receive one minimum wage. So it's, it's natural. But when you consider higher values in the formal sector, you have lower, uh, lower, lower, uh, lower elasticities. So this is to show the importance of minimum wage for different uh, wage rates in the formal sector. And I go here, this typical informal, informal sector, the, the independent workers, the, the workers that have no contract, they, they do not work for enterprise, they, do, they work for themselves. And you see what we found as elasticities. Uh, even more than one here, and then down, 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 up to 0.5 for the highest levels uh, of income for those workers. Okay? And then I apply those, those elasticities in the case of, uh, I, I'm not just considering a labor, labor market here, I also consider the pension system. The pension system, as I, I, I mentioned, the base of the pension si system is one minimum wage. So if the minimum wage increases 10%, the base goes together to 10% higher. So I, I, I calculate this for the labor market, formal, informal, and for the, the pension system. What I found? I found this. Uh, this is the starting point, the situation in, in 2004. The Gini index was 0.5778, so it's very high. Eh? This are, if you consider the world, this is a very high uh, Gini index for, <coughs> ah, this is, I, I am, I am not, in this case, I am not considering just the, the, the labor market. I'm considering the, the per capita family income, labor market, pensions, and so on. And you see that when you have 10% increase and you apply this, this exercise, you get this decrease for the, the, the Gini index depending what, on what you are considering. I'm just considering survival, pensions, pensions in general, all transfers, labor income, and all, all income. And so this should be the result of my simulations. What I show you is that ah, bef uh, between 2004 and 2013, the, this period of 10 years, uh, the, the real increase for minimum wage was this. So uh, using my simulation, I could say that uh, Gini index should decrease from 570 to 551. Uh, if I had, and I had it, 6, 7% of increase for minimum wage. This is the result of my exercise. And when I compare he, this with the real minimum wage in, to, in 2013, this uh, corresponds uh, to sort of half of the decrease. Half, more or less half, a little bit more. Then I could say that if you believe that it makes sense to make this exercise, around 50%, 56% of the decrease of Gini index in this period, considering all kinds of incomes, could be related to the increase of minimum wage. That, that's the exercise. And this is mentioned, this is one paper in the bibliography uh, for the simulation. And I have a uh, No, those, this is the, the conclusion of the, the, this exercise. The increase in minimum wage would have been responsible for 56% of the decline in family income inequality in this period, as measured by Gini index. Pension, ah, I, 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 uh, 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 uh. This is the behavior for pensions, the, the, the green one. It continues. As minimum wage continues to grow, uh, the pensions uh, effect conti continues to, to work. 
In the case of labor income, uh, there is a decrease up to here, and then it's sort of uh, uh, stable situation, so that uh, you don't have uh, an improvement anymore when you have an a very high increase in minimum wage uh, in the case of uh, income distribution. Then those are the, 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 the results. Uh, the increase in minimum wage have been responsible for around 50%, 56% of the decline in family income inequality in dispute, uh, and pensions and labor income. If you see the, the, the importance of either pensions for one, one side and labor income on the other side, you see that they, they, they have the same result, half and half. Five minutes? Okay. Five minutes. Okay. At 3 p.m., I stop. <clears throat> and the, the, the income deconcentration effect decreases. It, it is a result, expect, expected result, as the level of minimum wage increase. Because minimum wage increase, 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 then the effect is not that, that high. But uh, this is the final important result here is this econometric model that I use to calculate the relationship between the income distribution of labor income and the GDP and minimum wage. Or what's the role, uh, what's the effect of GDP and minimum wage on labor income distribution in this period, 2012 to 2017? This is also related to this paper. And the model is very simple. It couldn't be simpler. I use the log of the variables, and I consider minimum wage and GDP. And also, I consider the 10 tenths of the income distribution, the lowest to the top tenth. And uh, I have quarterly data from 2012 to 2017. It means six years multiplied by four quarters. I have 24 different data to, to estimate the, my regression. I use average values. And this is uh, the result. Uh, I would like to look here. When I divide the, the, the distribution in two, half, two halves, two halves, the lowest and the highest. And you see that if I am uh, working with logarithms, that means that those values are an estimation for elasticity. And you see that in the first half, you have an elasticity minimum wage income of 0.61, 61%. And in the second half, that means the highest one, it's much lower, it's 45. So it shows that in some sense, the elasticity is higher for the lower, uh, lower, lower income. And if you consider the 10 tenths, you have uh, the higher elasticities here in the middle. They are very low here. Uh, that means that uh, minimum wage doesn't work that much for very low laborers because if people in the informal sector that they have not the right to receive nothing compared to minimum wage. And so uh, the elasticities, elasticities are low, low, low. Here is the people that receive one minimum wage, of course, 0.99. But even here in the middle, you have relatively higher elasticities. And if you look at the effect of PB, P -P -B, uh, in terms of elasticities, they are lower than the minimum wage. Even here and here, usually they are much lower. Not, not here, here it's changed a little bit, but here is in the middle from the third to the seventh, tenth of the distribution, you have higher elasticity here than here. I used also the difference in logs to take care of uh, no stationarity. In some, in some tenths, you, I didn't show here, but in the, in the paper you see that in some cases there are signs of no, no stationarity, then you could use the difference in log. The results here are not that clear, 
but uh, uh, here is the higher elasticity for people that receive around one minimum wage. <coughs> it's still three minutes. Main results of the econometric model. Uh, we found higher minimum wage elasticities in the lower half of income distribution. I showed you. Uh, we, we found lower and less differentiated GDP elasticities in the two halves. In the two halves, the elasticity for GDP are lower. Higher elasticities in the third tenth of income distribution where incomes are close to minimum wage. Very low minimum wage effect for extremely low income levels, the lowest two tenths. <coughs> and as a result, we can say that minimum wage appears to have contributed in some sense to the improvement of labor income distribution in the center, more in the center of this distribution, not in the base. Future of minimum wage policy. What's going to happen with minimum wage policy with the new government? Probably the new government will be a right-wing government. We are going to see this next Sunday. So you don't know exactly what's going to happen. But anyway, I showed you four alternatives. From renewing the current legislation, using the increase of GDP instead, a per capita GDP that is somewhere related to productivity, per capita GDP growth, instead of just GDP, uh, just correction by inflation, forget GDP, just inflation. Let's keep the real value of minimum wage. Or eventually not have a new formal policy and go back to the period in which we didn't have. And, and I showed you in that period, the minimum wage increased a lot. So it's not necessary to have a formal policy to increase minimum wage. But anyway, uh, we don't know what's going to happen, of course. Final remarks, final remarks. What can I, I mention here as final remarks? First, between 2004 and 2014, the labor market showed a very fav favorable results in Brazil. This is clear. From 2004 to 2015, even with the dec deceleration of the economy, the, the, the labor market results were very positive. Even with the slowdown of the economy, uh, uh, the labor market continued to show relative positive results, etc., etc. Such policies, however, such pol policies, however, which policies? Uh, the policy, the counter-cyclical economic policies that uh, were de developed in the country contributed to increase the public deficit, leading to gov the government to take recessive measures. GDP decreased a lot in 2015 and 16 uh, because of those uh, changes in the economic policy. With the, these two years crisis, there has been a sharp drop in the labor market. The, shabor, the labor the result in labor market decreased a lot. Since 2017, the pace of the economy recovery uh, with the new uh, President Temer, the right uh, President, Vice uh, President uh, Temer, has been very, very low, the pace of the economy. 1% in 2017, maybe another 1% this year. The labor market has kept pace with the economy, showing a very slow recovery. Unemployment is still very high, and a high level of informality. Minimum wage, according to our simulation and the papers of other authors, contributed in the past, and they appear to have been, to have continued to, to make a positive contribution to the continuous improvement of uh, income distribution, labor income distribution, until 2016. From 2017 on, however, the income distribution deteriorated, and we can discuss this. 
uh, given the difficulties of the economy and the current financial crisis, there will be a strong pressure uh, to change the minimum wage law next January. And due to the current uncertainties on the electoral results, it's, the dif it's difficult to know what will be the future government policy for minimum wage. It's not clear at all. This is uh, the bibliographical reference for papers by me and some colleagues, three in English, developed in the No Poor project, in which I participated until, until last year, five years uh, this project. And those papers are published in the, in the site, in the No Poor site. And there is this discussion paper that's published my, my, by my universe that you can have uh, access if you enter www.ie.ufrgdr. Uh, okay? Thank you very much. Um, so there are a lot of things that were already developed by uh, Mr. Saboya, so most of them we're not going to talk about in detail again, but what we want to do is maybe try to shed some light on issues uh, also related to income and wealth inequality in general that were not directly addressed by Mr. Saboya in the, in the papers uh, he wrote with his colleagues. And um, yeah, so um, have another look again at this relation between, between the minimum wage policy and uh, the income distribution. So, uh, as Mr. Saboya show, we showed, we really had a, a, a sustained rise in the level of real minimum wage in Brazil uh, over the last 20 years, 150% uh, uh, on, the, on the period. And then when we look really at that specific period between 2003 and 2014, we have a 67% increase. And the question is, what is the effect of this on the main um, indicators of uh, the labor market and of s uh, uh, the standards of living and social conditions in general? So here I'm uh, essentially focusing on the, the first of the two papers that Mr. Saboya wrote. Um, and uh, so I consider the effect on labor income and its distri distribution in general and on s also household income in general and the effect on the wage share. Oh, something that is not taken into account in that paper is the effect on formalization because it's, um, it's considered apart the simulation because the distribution of the uh, employment structure is considered stable over the period, but as we can expect, this, this wage policy also has an impact on formalization. Okay, so basically what I did here is I, uh, I took all the, these graphs um, about uh, the elasticity of the income um, of several working groups and 20 years within these groups to the minimum wage and I put them on the same scale in order to compare them and so as we can see um, th the average value is pretty high it's like 0 0.85 in total so it's it's big but another trend <laughs> is that among these groups most of the curves are downward sloping. So this really means that actually the elasticity of um, labor to labor income to minimum wage is more important for the people in the lowest parts of the distribution. However, what I did here is that I more or less classified these different groups from those with the highest average income to those with the lowest average income. And when you do that, so you see that everywhere the value is high, but still one sort of uh, um, counterintuitive result that Mr. Saboya talk, talked about is that for the very poorest workers and the, 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 the very poorest workers in the poorest groups, since they're not included as well in the formal labor market as the others, actually you don't see the effect of uh, the, re the real minimum wage on their income being so important as it could be <coughs> otherwise. Okay. Um, so, I think this is something that's important from a policy point of view. How can we uh, make this uh, policy more effective for the, the, the most vulnerable groups? Okay. 
so yeah, also in the functional distribution, this was not uh, really uh, talked about in the presentation, but we also see that actually if we try to simulate the impact of the rise in uh, real minimum wage for the functional distribution of income, the wage share of in the Brazilian economy gained 5% uh, over the period and 3.2% would be due to this rise mm -hmm. in minimum wage. Uh, so going from there, as uh, Mr. Saboya showed, you have an impact on the overall distribution of income, of uh, per capita household income. Um, and as we see on these graphs, so while the real minimum wage was going up, uh, main indicators of um, income inequality and poverty went down, okay? So uh, you really have uh, a strong relation as shown by the simulations of Mr. Saboya through two main channels, uh, which are the, li the redistributive effects of labor income growth itself, so which is shown here with these downward, downward sloping curves, and then the effect through the transfers that are indexed or almost indexed to the value of the minimum wage, okay? Um, however, so something that you would like to open for discussion here is that um, when, when this relation between minimum wage and inequality is uh, concerned, uh, not much attention is paid to um, other uh, policies that are not in the, the labor market themselves, such as the, the transfer programs as Bolsa Familia. And um, yes, yeah, so mainly we uh, mainly uh, minimum wages, FSIs, and not transfers in general. And mm -hmm. also, one thing is that um, if we would look at wealth inequalities in general and not just income inequalities, maybe that actually the level of observed inequality would not have decreased as much as we see uh, in uh, in that simulation. Um, so yeah, basically I wanted to just stress that behind this uh, still strong redistrib redistributive effect, there are other policies that are in the background that also impact. So about the transfers and programs like Bolsa Familia already said, but also something that's important is actually to have this rise in uh, the, the real minimum wage, you also needed at some point to have a monetary policy that was able to fight inflation good enough in order to have it. And that was the case in Brazil precisely at the beginning of that period since 1994 with uh, the real plan, I think it's called. Okay. Also, I think fiscal policy and state intervention in the economy helped create better conditions uh, that um, increased the bargaining power of the workers, actually gaining uh, real gains from this in, uh, rise in uh, minimum uh, wage. And yeah, so basically I think for the rest we're, we're going to switch to what Duji has to tell us. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so now uh, we're just uh, going to try and uh, show some updated figures to, to collaborate with Professor Saboya's uh, analysis. Uh, and we're going to focus in the, pro, uh, in the period after the crisis, so the crisis period and the subsequent years. Um, just before starting, um, we'd like to highlight that most of the analysis are considering uh, people inside the labor market, so like the effects of the minimum wage to people who, uh, who manage to stay employed. And we are going to try to, to bring up some issues that are related to people who like who were thrown out of the labor market in one way uh, or another. So, just this is, uh, uh, this image was uh, a bit differently, but already shown by, by Professor Saboya. The main idea I wanted to show very quickly was just that, although you have a more or less sustained uh, level for the minimum wage, real minimum wage and average, real average uh, income. Uh, the total income, so the mass of wages, uh, well, increased a lot in the period, decreased a lot in the crisis, and showed some recovery uh, from mid-16 onwards. And this movement here, uh, one can argue this is mainly due to p 
people, this effect of people going out of, of the labor force and in also out of uh, the their employment positions and in again. Um, so with data we have now, we can see that the structure of the labor market has changed in some important ways. Uh, taking the second quarter of the of 2014 as the basis of, com of comparison uh, and getting data from the second quarter of this year, you can see that formal employment decreased 11%. And at the same time, you had an increase in informal employment and in own employment. This shows uh, a weakening, a weaker structure of the labor market, a more vulnerable situation of overall employed people. When it comes to the own employed, uh, there, is, there are two important considerations that are not straightforward, mainly for people that are not Brazilian. One regards uh, the so-called uh, individual, micro-individual entrepreneurs. This is like basically a juridical person of one. So I can become a, 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 an enterprise of myself and then I'm, I'm going to be ranked here. Even though I do a work that is very, very similar to those that employed people or even uh, people in the informal uh, inform, uh, employment make uh, do. The other uh, important issue is the labor reform that was approved in the end of 17. Uh, don't have time to like go into that in that, but one of the main uh, points of the reform was to legalize outsourcing all companies' uh, activities, uh, and this one can argue that this was a push uh, towards. Um, uh, firing former employees and getting in some way uh, people to do the same things as uh, a, a micro individual entrepreneur or in another different way. So just these are uh, the number of formal employments according, according to Kajet data, data. You can see that it decreased a lot during the crisis and this is probably due to the effects of the crisis itself. But it also has a strong decrease here. This is the end of 17 when the law was approved. So like one can really make this, this argument, it's at least in the first sight, is a strong argument. I'm not going to go uh, to talk about uh, a lot about this, but it's uh, a measure of the workers' bargaining power. Basically, these are wage agreements. Green ones are the ones above inflation, yellow equal to inflation, and red below inflation. So you can see that the agreements uh, equal or below inflation increased a lot in 15, 16, and less, but still importantly, in, in 17. This shows that the crisis were re was really uh, rough on the workers' position. And the last, uh, yeah. So the last point I wanted to stress was exactly what I started with. So the idea that you have an important issue, and this must have been important to uh, income inequality, evolution in Brazil that regards people that are not employed anymore. So, uh, I'm sorry, this is in Portuguese, but, oh no, this is in English, okay. Uh, so this, the gray line is unemployed people, this is in thousands. You can see that it increased a lot during the crisis and remained at high levels afterwards. And at the same time, these, many times people don't pay attention but people who are outside of the working force, so people that are in working age and etc., increased considerably in the period. It's an increase of 5.1% uh, uh, considering uh, the first part of 2014 until now. This means roughly 3 million people, 3 million 100 people more. So uh, this really collaborates with this. Uh, figure here, like these people being thrown, thrown, thrown out of the, the labor market must have had an important uh, influence in this labor income. And just to end up and wrap up, we wanted to raise some open questions that might uh, help in the, the discussion. So, um, so of course, like the overall idea of how this, this evolution of the labor market affected income inequality, I think Professor Saboy already went through that. 
Uh, one issue is whether this sort of analysis, uh, mainly the one regarding uh, minimum wage, if it's applicable to other economies or if it's country specific. Uh, another aspect that I personally think is important is to consider what, uh, what's the place of the new labor law in, in uh, the evolution of the labor market and of income inequality now and in the coming years. And uh, the paper is not looking to wealth inequality, whether looking to wealth inequality is important or not, and what, what did happen in this sense in Brazil throughout the period would also be int interesting to look at. And uh, so somehow also converging to the last points made by Professor Saboya, what's coming to in the future? So what can be expected and what could be proposed in, s in terms of labor market and income inequality reduction policies. Uh, so yeah, that's basically it. Yeah. Okay, so um, today as you noticed, um, there is this recording going on and for the questions we will ask you to talk in the microphone as well, okay? Um, before we start with the questions, uh, I'd like to just add one more specific question as well in line with the last one, but. So given the fact that, um, as, y as it's shown in the simulation, the, <coughs> the, increase, the decreases in inequality, income inequality that is brought by the rise in the minimum wage is less important for marginal, marginal increases, and also given the fact that this is um, putting pressure on the fiscal deficit, uh, what, what type of combination of redistributive policies would you uh, advise to uh, say uh, this is maybe not very realistic given the current perspectives, but to a left-wing government in Brazil. <coughs> okay, so now we're going to um, start with the questions. As we already did last time, I think uh, you should try to really uh, focus on one specific question. And uh, if you want to add something to the list, then you know um, it will be given priority to the people who have not talked yet. Okay. So, I don't know if you already want to react <coughs> to this. I don't or know what, what do, what's Does someone have a, a question in mind? Yeah, let's okay. listen to them. Oh, we add up all. all yeah, yeah, please come, yeah, away. Please come back here. And, uh, okay. And I'm going to be taking questions, so if you want to. To use a microphone. Uh, hi, I'm Matthias from Option B, which is uh, macroeconomics, political economy, and finance. I was a bit puzzled by the figure of the Shini index between employed workers, uh, how it reduced during the peak of the crisis, actually. So I would like to know, actually, if you know between the segments of workers, why did that happen? If they, it happened that like the better rewarded wages, uh, employment, um, employments were uh, more was affected by the crisis, or the lower ones. I mean, why did the dispersion on wages reduced? Which wages, which kind of employments were the most affected ones? We do the way that you are used to. Okay, then. I have lots of points that you made. Uh, <laughs> uh, I thank you for your reading. It's really impressive that uh, you mentioned very important points that I didn't touch. Uh, <clears throat> let me try to, to organize the, the ideas. Um, yeah, the point of the, uh, the, the elasticities in general, they are very high, point, point 0.85. I didn't calculate that, that number, but uh, it's really very high, but it's very differentiated according to the kind of workers and the level of income. This is uh, the most uh, important thing. 
and uh, you showed the, the case of uh, the domestic workers. We and we have just uh, <coughs> the opposite. That means yes, uh, yes. the elasticities the are much higher in the top. Why? And this is the poorest group. Yeah. Because they receive around mi uh, one minimum wage. The domestic wages are very low. Most people are informal. So minimum wage doesn't work that much for them, especially in the lower levels. And so uh, it's clear there. Where is it? This one. The, the elasticities increase. Yeah. And they are higher for the highest levels. But the highest levels there means <coughs> a little bit more than one minimum wage. So that's why the, uh, uh, you have s such a different uh, shape. <coughs> I did uh, show you the results that me and uh, João Alac Neto, uh, my ex-student, <coughs> presented in that paper. And uh, we, just, we didn't also study labor, uh, personal, uh, the income distribution. We also uh, try to analyze <coughs> the effect of minimum wage on the functional distribution. That means profits versus uh, capital gains. And uh, this part was João Alac, Alac's part, not my part, so I, I didn't show. But anyway, it's very interesting his result that uh, he, he calculated because he showed that uh, what is it, the, the figure there uh, is 3.2 out of 5.6%. Uh, 3.2 out of 5.6. That means 60% of the increase uh, in the functional distribution toward the, the labor income could be related to minimum wage. This is a very important result. But I, I, I had no possibility to, to show uh, here. <coughs> Poverty v versus minimum wage, like Bolsa Família versus minimum wage. They, they have uh, different uh, uh, roles. Minimum wage, in my opinion, in the opinion of most of my colleagues, is more related to income distribution, either in the labor market or in the pension system. While for poverty, is the direct transfer programs to the po poor people, like Bolsa Família. Bolsa Família works on the directly on poor people. That means it's directly to, to poor people. Poverty is Bolsa Família and other transfer programs direct to poor people. Not to, uh, minimum <coughs> wage, because when you receive a minimum wage, like a couple that receive one minimum wage each, you are not in the base anymore. You are almost in the middle of the distribution. So minimum wage is a relatively high value for uh, Brazilian income. So minimum wage is not, uh, uh, is not uh, <coughs> direct to, to poverty. It's much more related to, to income distribution. Uh, wealth inequality. The, the data I showed you, uh, labor data, most labor data, are family income from PNAD. This is, uh, is I obtained those data going to, the, to the, the, the house of people. And so you have all problems of this kind of, of data. But I have some colleagues, there are some people in Brazil, they are working with the revenue, the revenue income data. And the results are not quite the same. Because when you consider the, the, the income revenue data, the decrease in minimum wage in the, in the Gini index, for instance, is not that high. First, it's the, the Gini index is higher. And th there is almost no decrease. So it depends on, on, on your, your uh, data utilized. Uh, I <coughs> wealth data is very difficult to get because you know, this information is more complicated. But 
Wealth uh, inequality, of course, is much higher than income inequality and much higher than uh, labor income inequality. That's for sure. But we do not have enough data, in, do, do not discuss that much due to lack of data. Uh, minimum wage and productivity. This is a point that I mentioned in one of those papers. Uh, raising minimum wage is not just a question, let's raise it and go ahead and see what happens. Uh, the minimum wage value has to be uh, in equilibrium in some sense with the productivity of the, the labor productivity of the country. We, you cannot, f f I showed you that uh, the relationship from average uh, income, average, average labor income in minimum wage is like 2.3 to 1. So we cannot just uh, double minimum wage like that from one year to the other one, that you, you have all kinds of problems in employment, unemployment, maybe inflation. And uh, so uh, it, it, it has to be compared in some sense with labor productivity. And labor productivity in Brazil is not that high. Eh? And when you compare labor productivity with the labor productivity in other Latin American countries, our situation is not uh, that great. Eh? So uh, there are limits to the increase uh, of uh, minimum wage. So we have to take care with this. Another point important that you mentioned. I worked with uh, people that remained uh, in the labor market with employment, people employed. And I mentioned that three million people just lost their formal employment. So uh, you have to take care because this is a situation for people that remain in the labor market. If you call, uh, I have a colleague, uh, Rodolfo Hoffman, for instance, my colleague uh, from Sao Paulo. He calculates uh, the Gini index uh, <coughs> using zero income for the people that are unemployed. So the result is not the same because uh, the, the, the income distribution starts to, to get worse before um, the data I showed you. So you have to, to understand what's being discussed here. And if you consider zero income for uh, unemployed people, you find something else. This is a situation for people that remain in the labor market with a, with a job. Another data that you show there, this is very important. Since uh, millions of people lost their jobs, the mass, the total income, varied a lot. I showed you the average income for people remained uh, in the labor market. But when you multiply number of people working by average income, you have a fluctuation that was very important during uh, 2015 and 2016. And you show the data. That's, that's very important. And <coughs> also very important, the, the, the change in the, those three big groups in labor market, formal in, in employees, informal, informal employees, and self, uh, self, how you say? I said uh, independent workers or self-employed people. And you, you saw the, the change. In the, this is from 2014 to 2018. In those four years, the composition of the workers changed a lot with a decrease in informal labor and since people, they, they have to find something, some revenue, they go to the informal sector and get some, something uh, to, to do, uh, and they get some income. And those, uh, it, it increased the own em employment and the, e the informal employment. So, okay, that was very important to, to bring this information uh, here. The labor reform. The labor reform is very recent. So, they are not yet good analysis about it. The, 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 the arguments that the, 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 the president and the, 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 the people that proposed the, the labor reform was to create jobs. 
this was uh, increase the, the negotiations, the possibility of negotiations on one side, and create a situation more favorable to create jobs. And so they created two kinds of jobs. I don't know how to, how to translate this, but uh, one form, one kind is uh, inter inter intermittent. How do you say this? Inter you are called to work a few days, then to go out, or you came back when I call you again. I don't know how, uh, what is the best inter Huh? Yeah, flexible in this, but flexibility is complicated. Uh, flexible in the sense that you don't have a, a, you have a formal contract in the days that you work. But I just call you for the weekend. So you will have your rights in the weekend. But then see you maybe next weekend or not. So is a contingent, yeah. So this is why it's one creation. The other creation was the partial job. This is a good one. I think partial job is very good, but many people would prefer to have a 20 hours a week job. But this intermi intermittent, I don't know, how it's contingent job that was, okay, these are going to create jobs. But the, the, the results are poor, poor, poor. The creation of j new jobs in those two categories is peanuts. It's nothing. We did not create jobs. The problem is that if you are in the middle of a crisis or a very low growth, you have no conditions to create either, f no conditions to create any kind of jobs, mainly formal jobs. So the results up to now, they are very deceiving, not the deceiving, depends on your point of view. Expected in some sense, in my, in my, in my way of seeing the things, I think uh, simp uh, simply it happened what was expected in the middle of a crisis. No reform will create jobs. And the period I discuss here, mainly from 2004 to 2014, was a period of uh, minimum wage that increased a lot, that uh, unemployment rate that decreased a lot. So uh, this is, in some sense, uh, unexpected if you consider the uh, orthodox uh, economics. Economics, that if uh, wages are increasing that much, you will create uh, unemployment. But why not? Because it was a period of a high growth in the economy. So very favorable conditions to create jobs. And jobs were created. Formal or informal, but mainly formal jobs were created until 2014. And it started to be destroyed with the crisis. So the, the relationship, economy and jobs creation is so clear. And this, uh, I, I try to... to to show you this, exactly this. Ah, the, the, yeah, the, 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 the as, uh, data is interesting, the negotiations uh, below and above uh, the, the inflation rate. And during the, the crisis period here, you have lots of negotiations uh, 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 wage negotiations that were uh, below uh, inflation. But with uh, the recovering of the economy in 2017, this changed again. This is another story. This is before 2004, so we're not going to discuss. And uh, okay, there is a point of non-employed people. The, the non-employed people increased the unemployed people. People outside of the labor force. That, yeah. People, that, that, uh, how you call it? The Zalento. people. Huh? In Zalento. Yeah, desalento. But in, in English. Discouraged workers. Discouraged workers, yeah. There are, uh, the, it increased a lot the, the number of discouraged workers during this, the crisis. Uh, okay, that's an uh, important point because since I was just considering those employed, 
you cannot forget the other ones. Uh, in the, the open questions, uh, Brazil versus other countries. I, I don't have anything uh, precise to, to, to discuss here. Maybe someone from other countries could uh, contribute. Uh, the, ra the role of the labor reform, I, was, I am very pessimistic about. Uh, the wealth inequality, I, 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 I mentioned already the, the data with the, when you consider the revenue, the income revenue, and you consider the top of the top, it's amazing how they protect themselves. The, the, the story of the 1% is, is real in Brazil too. The 1%, they, they, they maybe uh, they, they, they increase their, their, their part, but uh, when you consider the labor income or family income, you consider PNAD data, you don't see the, the 1%. They, they do not tell. The 1% do not tell the, the true income. This is all over the world. And this is not just a Brazilian case. <coughs> what else to do? That's a good question. <laughs> what else to do? I think uh, point number one is to grow, to make a way of uh, growing again, because the period of growth, we had no problem. The labor market improved a lot. The question is uh, how to, to grow. Okay. And uh, we are in a, in a point that uh, we are going to elect a new president in two days, three days. Probably will be Mr. Bolsonaro. That I, I, I'm not going to tell you about him. It's, he's horrible. It's not just a question of being right wing. Okay, right wing. You can be right wing. It's okay. Nothing. Okay, no problem. But he's horrible. He's a macho man. He's, a, uh, he's a, against gays. He's clearly against gays. He's against, he's, He's misogynist, how you say misogynist? Misogynist. And uh, he's a horrible person. And he will be, I think he'll be the new president. So it's a question of how much he will be able to, to do what he would like to do and what he's not going to do because the institutions in the country will not permit, will not allow them, him to do this. Uh, but I, I forget this, the, the, the policy. And if, if you think uh, uh, in economics, in the economy, I would say protect minimum wage. Uh, do not uh, leave minimum wage decrease again as it was in the past. And increase the transfer programs as much as you can, especially in a period of uh, higher unemployment and uh, decrease of uh, the income of three poor people and three million, 5.8 percent of increase of people from people for people outside the, the, the labor market. You have to protect them. So the trans both of both of family and other transfer programs should be used and used and used. And they do not cost that much. If you consider, uh, Bolsa Família uh, represents 0.5% of uh, GDP. It's not a, a huge amount. So you can find some small money to, to increase those transfer programs and protect those that are in the base of the income distribution. OK, that's it. So ah. Your point. What's your point? I forget. I forgot. I was wondering about the GDP reduction in the years of the crisis among employed people. Like, why, why did that happen? The, the reduction in the GDP index among work working people. Oh, sorry, yeah. The reduction in the GDP index among workers, uh, if it's like because <coughs> the lower or higher tiers of the employment of the I labor I market. I think if effective. you are protecting the base of the income, through uh, uh, minimum wage in a period of crisis, mm -hmm. this helps gene, gene index not to, to, to grow in some sense. 
But in the other sense, you have to take care of the, with this change between people that uh, went out from the labor formal market and went to the informal labor market. But this needs uh, 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 an analysis that uh, I don't have enough information here to, to, to tell you is this, that, or that. Mm -hmm. But anyway, you have to consider the change inside the labor market, those that <coughs> remained, yeah, and the people question. that left. Yeah, For those question. that remained, the minimum wage increased in, in, yes. in, in, in 2015, yeah. 16, and 17, and maybe 18 also. Mm -hmm. You have to see 18 at the end of the year. So if you protect the, the minimum value in the labor market, at least in the formal labor market, in some sense, you help to protect uh, and not uh, the, the gene index not to increase. So but it's, it's a, a mixture of okay. change inside and in the income, in income structure. Uh, so I'm Kezia Braga from Option B. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, I think we already answered this, but I would like to ask like uh, clearly, because uh, as we saw, some indicators are getting better after 2017, 2018, and I strongly disagree with uh, economic policies from uh, government timber. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's it's worse if you look in after like 2003 2006 like if you look for the long picture but if you look for this year it's getting it's not getting worse but it's okay so i would like to to ask you why like what are the reasons that makes this but not which fall data? which one Are unemployment this? it's not falling it's unemployment it's falling it's there's a little bit. It, 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 you know, it, it came back to the same behavior, the seasonal behavior, with a, a trend towards a lower level. Very, very slowly. Okay. Unemployment. Uh, and uh, income, it was, it was income I mentioned the, the decrease of inflation. Decrease of inflation, but because, as I mentioned, those data are for people that remain employed. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, at the same time, you, you, you had uh, the, the, the inflation, in, I showed you, inflation in 2015 was over 10%. In 2016, it decreased to 5 or 6%. In 2017, to less than 3%. This uh, changed a lot, the real income. And so, the, the uh, average income, uh, the labor income, sort of either remain the same level or increase a little bit. And I am convinced that this was related to inflation, to lowering inflation. But the third data is horrible. The informality, the informal data, this is horrible, this doesn't, doesn't change. That's related to what they changed, what they, they showed. They show that it, it decreased the, the form employment and it increased the informal and uh, the independent employment and workers. So uh, uh, this, uh, this makes uh, uh, informal informality to increase. This is, in my opinion, this is the, the worst data in the labor market in, in the recent last months, last few years. This is informality because if you look be be before, I, I did show you. I, no, I did show. I, I no, I did. I, I no, I didn't. I, I did. I did show you the, from the period of 2004 to 2014, the informality rate decreased. It was huge. The decrease of informality, uh, and uh, up to 2014, and this this increase in informality is uh, something new. This is related to, to the crisis, and it continues. Even with uh, this, is, this low uh, GDP growth, it continues. But 
it's mainly the, the bad, bad, bad data is mainly in this question of formality, informality. That's it. That's uh, yes. that's the point. Hi, uh, I'm Sophia from Option A, which is the innovation and knowledge uh, focus. Um, I can have a question a bit. I know you touched on the subject already, but um, some argue that, I mean, the a minimum wage, it's not just always the solution, especially in a crisis, as you mentioned, it could also be, you know, a, a barrier to keeping jobs. Uh, so I don't know if it's just the plain solution to keep a a minimum wage because it's only like you said the people that then stay within uh, the formal market that you're considering like after this happens maybe they can increase but you still have this large share of the population that are outside the labor market and um, since um, there was a long time before where they didn't need a minimum wage and it was still increasing then how can we really argue that the minimum wage is the solution and that was you know that we can grant all these positive things that happened before to the minimum wage. Okay, it's not a solution. I agree with you. The solution is growth. Economic growth is the solution, not minimum wage. But uh, uh, arguing that you should uh, take care of with minimum wage and maybe uh, decrease a little bit to create jobs, I don't believe it. I don't believe at all. The experience of Brazilian experience up to 2014 was a huge increase in minimum wage and a huge creation of jobs. Why? Because we had economic growth. So this is, a, this is the usual economic thought about uh, increasing wages and not creating jobs. But in, in the case of Brazil, it's, it's a counter example what happened up to 2014. Of course, we have a difficult now because of the economic crisis. But what to do? To decrease minimum wage? To create jobs? No way. This doesn't work. I can't believe, I don't believe this, really. But I understand your point. But I don't see uh, the solution is to decrease the wage in general and minimum wage in particular. And the markets, if the market uh, decide to decrease the wage, they will decrease. They, they will pay you less, they will just uh, get someone else to, to work in the same job and pay less and it will work. No problem to, to throw away a, a worker. It's very easy in Brazil, no problem. But uh, I, I, I like just to, to say this. Is the, what it is the history of Brazil in the, the, pe that period? And the history is clear. Uh, uh, revenues, labor revenues, and minimum wage increasing, and huge creation of jobs, and formal jobs. What's behind it? Economic growth. So, désolé. <laughs> That's okay. I, I understand your point, and it's important. So, uh, I'm Nils from uh, the Option C. It's Development uh, Economics. Uh, I was wondering, um, you talking about like a, a, distru a massive destruction of um, formal jobs and a significant creation of informal jobs. And I was wondering if these uh, took place in the same sectors and maybe the same industries, and if it's just a change of uh, an economic landscape in Brazil, or if it's just the, a shift to a new form of employment by the same companies that are still producing the same amount at the same price? Usually, uh, the destruction of jobs, most of it, was in industry. It started in the beginning of the crisis, and it was very important. Sao Paulo, for instance, uh, where is the center of uh, Brazilian industry, uh, it, it, there was a huge discussion because the automobile industry is very important and so, is, uh, you know, when you have a, a few thousand employees in Volkswagen or other in, uh, industries uh, being laid off, it's a, it's a news, it's a something important. But uh, usually, okay, in, in a few words, in 
the distraction was most in the industry, in, in the manufacturing industry and the, the, the construction industry also. And the, the informal cre job creation is mainly in the service sector. It's a transfer. Not the same pe people. You cannot just transfer from in industry to, to service. In some cases, of course, you can do this, but not in general. But the, 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 service, the service sector is where there, there are a, a, a strong creation of jobs in Brazil, either in the recession or in the crisis, or when the economy is growing, uh, the service sector represents 70% uh, of jobs. I, I, I want to tell you something for the year 2014. Okay, 2014 was the beginning of the recession. In that year, uh, the, f the, the creation of formal jobs was four, uh, 400,000 formal jobs created in 2014, the beginning of the recession. The creation of jobs, formal jobs, in that, that year, in the service sector, was much more than this. It's, it's amazing this day. Like, you, you had, the, let's see, for instance, you had the creation of, it's not exactly this, but let's say 800,000 formal jobs in the service sector, but you have a distraction of 400,000 formal jobs in the industry, and this gives uh, uh, 400,000 jo new jobs in the formal sector. That, that is, even before the crisis, but during the crisis in the, the informal job creation, is the service sector the, the solution, in some sense, in the service sector where you have creation, either formal or informal. <clears throat> um, first, thank you for your presentation. I'm Jan from Option A, that's uh, Knowledge and Innovation Policies. Uh, I, would, I would like to continue a bit uh, from the uh, question of, uh, from Niels about the composition of that work, because especially since this one? 2004, no, the, like since 2004 we've seen uh, an increase in real wage and also an increase in employment. But I was wondering a bit about the composition of, tho of those works, if something changed uh, about sectors and, uh, yeah, about well the composition, and if it does have some impact on the productive structure of Brazil. So if you think that something has changed in terms of the productive structure of Brazil, and if it does have uh, some impact on terms of long-term development, like more think about <coughs> long term uh, and okay let's see uh, if you look uh, at long term for instance last uh, 20 years the sector distribution it's clear that okay. there is an increase of the service sector is increasing a lot and uh, the manufacture and construction Industry, they are lowering. But, but inside those sectors. Okay, let's let's continue. Sorry. Inside, for instance, the, the service sector. I, I'm working on service sector right now. I'm very interested on the service sector. The heterogeneity inside the the service sector is huge. It's huge. You have since the domestic work. When you you have a domestic work at your house. And other you go the, the, the other extreme is the the finance sector, where the wages and productivity is much higher. The banks are making a lot of money and paying better better wages to, to workers. But most of the structure of the service, most is traditional service. But the good news, the good news is that the structure is changed a little bit. The, the best service sector is increasing and the traditional is decreasing. It's not a, 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 a yesterday I, I was at an Institut d'Amérique Latina uh, and I, show, I, I discussed the service sector with them. 
and, and then uh, the figures are still very low because most of people who that work in the service sector they are uh, in those traditional. But anyway, the trend is to increase the, the best the best service part of this the sector. This is from this side. From the manufacturing industry, <coughs> you have a, 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 a destruction. The, the, the problem is in the manufacturing industry in general is that uh, its, it's, it's uh, weight in the GDP decreased a lot in the last 10, 15 years, decreased a lot. And you have the same problem. Inside the manufacturing industry, you have those most uh, modern sectors and uh, the other ones. And the data that I remember looking at this uh, some time ago is that in the case of manufacturing industry, it is more concentrated in lower skill sectors. And maybe it's increasing this part of the manufacturing industry. But I, I have to, to look at the data, what's happening right now. But as trend, mainly during the crisis, is a, is ex it's clear. But this, the, 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 what is interesting is that it's usually service sector, people do not look like uh, very much. Uh, and I, I am working with this data now, and uh, I see some good trends uh, from, from 2004 on, even uh, until 2015. But there are big changes in the in the economic structure of the country, of course. What about you, Pascal? You will have my question. No, there is still someone. It's my turn? Ah, I thought you wanted to ask that's, yeah. the, that's the last one. No, I uh, I'm Chris from Option C uh, Development Policies, and I wonder about you were talking about the link between the fiscal deficit and the increasing of the minimum wage, and I'm not so much. I don't know about Brazil. Like uh, we're like in a post keynesian tradition, we talk about the wage-led and profit-led um, uh, growth regime. So I wonder first. Um, about if there's really like uh, a reason for this link between the uh, increasing fiscal deficit and the uh, increasing minimum wage, as like many post Keynesian uh, economists would argue that uh, actually a uh, like, uh, higher wage share would uh, increase the growth. So I wonder if there's actually a link and if you can argue for this. And second, this is then also connected to the, um, to the out view you have on, on the elections. Um, because in Germany we introduced the minimum wage, I think, in 2015, and it was always the conservative and the liberals, so not even like an extreme right government, which were opposing it uh, hardly. So is there actually not also the chance that uh, Brazil will, will uh, just get rid of the minimum wage after all? So isn't this, this a danger as well in this regard? Yeah, that's, that's a very good point. Uh, minimum wage is not responsible for the fiscal crisis, of course. But since the minimum value paid in the pension system, uh, the public pension system, is a one minimum wage, when you increase the minimum wage, you, you, you increase the expense, in the, the government expense. That, that, that was the only point that, that I mentioned there. But the fiscal crisis is related to other questions, of course. And in the period, of, uh, in the first, first, first Dilma, Dilma government, she, uh, how you say this? Uh, in order to create conditions to recuperate the economy that was showing already some signs of decrease, she lowered a lots of uh, taxes, taxes for enterprise. Uh, all kind of, lots of I will not discuss all, all details, but this had a huge cost for the country because 
lowering taxes in a moment in which the economy is going down, it means that your receipt is decreasing because the economy is going down and because you are decreasing taxes. So this was, in my opinion, at the beginning, at the, the origin of uh, this uh, fiscal crisis. Bec because before, you had a surplus just in the, how I say, the, the, the primary surplus. When you consider the, the, the payment of interest, you had a, a deficit. But when she started to decrease in those uh, taxes and the economy started to go down, then uh, the fiscal crisis sh showed uh, clearly she was in front of you. And the, the role of minimum wage in this case is just because it's a basic value in the pension system. So uh, I, I showed the, the, that figure that when you increase 1% minimum wage, you increase the, the public expense in the, in the transfer, in the dispenser system of the 800 million euros. But of course, uh, it's not uh, the minimum wage fault. Huh? It's just a small part, a very small one. And also, I did not discuss here, but uh, uh, interest rates in Brazil are huge, huge, huge. Even for, for the public debt, the public papers that uh, the government <coughs> used to finance it, to finance it the, the, the interest rates are very high. And I showed you, the, when you consider the primary uh, and you add up the, to the primary the interest, the payment of interest, you have a huge nominal de deficit. So this is maybe the, 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 the reason, the main reason for this, this public debt. Yeah, hello, my name is Yannick. Uh, I'm also from the option of development economics. And I just simply just um, wanted to know if you see a link uh, between um, the labor market performance and uh, the recent upswing of uh, right wingness in the government. Uh, maybe also related, uh, you showed us the, the crisis, I think, in 2015 16 or 14 15. Yeah. yeah. Should I wait for the second one? Hi, my name is Michelle. I'm from Option A, Innovation and Knowledge. And my question is also related to the debt and uh, fiscal policies. Uh, you have mentioned the increase uh, over informal jobs. So uh, a part of the discussion that we had, uh, that Dilma had, uh, this fiscal policy for big firms. Uh, what do you think about the small and medium enterprises? Because they do have a very uh, weight of uh, taxes and also these fiscal issues. So in a certain point, if we have this uh, specific policy for those, ki those kinds of uh, enterprises, would it be uh, possible to increase the formal, formal jobs in the sense because now Brazil have this mm -hmm. very increased uh, taxes over the small and medium enterprises. Yeah, the, the point. But uh, which kind of policies you you have? Which kind of policy you have in mind uh, for, for the medium? No, that that's a question <laughs> for you. <laughs> <laughs> Because I think no, this there are, can there be are some a fiscal job creation. There uh, are some reasons. fiscal policies for uh, for the small enterprise that you have this uh, uh, the, the instead of having to, to pay all taxes, uh, you have a flat one, a flat tax that's very positive, favorable to small and medium size up to a certain level, and this works. This works, but of course. There is a cost for the government because if you are lowering, lowering rates, uh, tax rates for enterprises, you have to see what's going to happen with the fiscal system. But okay, it's uh, there are already some some uh, policies 
to this kind of enterprise, uh, me, small and medium size, and you, you could maybe try to find something else. I, I don't know, I don't have a, exactly any proposal to, to, to tell you, but anyway, I just want to, to say that there are already some uh, uh, policies towards uh, small and uh, medium size uh, enterprise, either from the uh, fiscal size or if you consider the, the credit, you know, some credit is special, credit for some kind of enterprise. Okay, this is a, it's always a possibility. But this is the point. The point of what's happening in Brazil, why the right wing is so strong now. That's the point. And if, uh, at which point this is related to, to, to labor market, to minimum wage? No, it's not that. It's a big surprise for me. Anyway, I want to tell you. I couldn't imagine that Bolsonaro, that stupid guy, that ha have no clear ideas, could be the next president. I couldn't imagine this six months ago. It was a big surprise for the whole, for me, for my, my friends, my colleagues, for everybody. Because when he, he, he started as candidate, you said, ah, it's not working, this guy's crazy, he says n'importe quoi, stupid, and, uh, but you know, all of a sudden he was in the first place and increasing, increasing, he passed in the first place in the first, first round and now, now he has, uh, what is it, the last figures, 56 to 36? Anyway, yeah. <laughs> it's 10 points, more or less 10 points uh, between the two. So just three days to, to the election. I would say what I see, uh, <coughs> why, why Bolsonaro? Bolsonaro, is, uh, he supports uh, dictatorship. That's clear, he, he mentions, he says, the guy that was uh, taught uh, the most important uh, torturer, you say this, mm -hmm. this word, and uh, during the dictatorship, he loved the guy, he mentioned this guy, he was great, etc. and so on. So, uh, what else? Uh, he's anti-feminist, uh, he's anti-gay, he's so bad. But how people are voting for him? I think before uh, starting, there is an anti PT feeling, PT is PT, Workers' Party. There is an anti-Workers' Party feeling is very strong in Brazil. After uh, uh, 12, 13, 14 years of government of PT, for Workers' Party in government, because uh, it was found so many corruption. And uh, for people in general, they, they, they believe that is pity fault, is, is Lula's fault, is Dilma's fault. And of course they have some fault, but it's not only. Because the, the, the Temer, the vice, the vice president that's now in power, he's surrounded of uh, co corrupted politicians. So he's in the middle of corruption, the, 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 the vice, that's not from PT. The vice that is from the MDB, the MDB, the other, the right, the right, uh, right wing party. But anyway, for most people, the fault is Lula's fault. He's in prison. The ex-president is in prison, so it's his fault. Let's vote, vote against him. We don't want PT back in the country. And uh, there is a feeling that all politicians are corrupted. And Bolsonaro is a sort of a different politician. So he, he could uh, 
uh, bring the, the votes, uh, it's, but it's a surprise for the country, not for the, only for me. People, do not, people that really talk about uh, polit politics and they are around discussing, etc., they try to understand. And it was a, a big surprise, but I, I think it's related to corruption and the PT, PT governments, many, and these anti politicians feeling in general. And, and he could attract people to himself. And so it is. I'll try to be fast. My name is Hannah. I'm from option B as well. Um, I would like to ask a question regarding wage agreements in general in Brazil uh, and the importance of the minimum wage in that if they are mostly if other wages are mostly oriented on the minimum wage yeah. so that we can see the same ev um, evolution of uh, increases and decreases throughout all wages and which would also highlight again, the importance of the minimum wage in Brazil, also for future growth paths, I would guess. Um, for? for future growth uh, strategies for like uh, domestic consumption of yeah. domestic um, output. Um, yes, let's leave it like this. Um, my name is Luisa, I'm from option C, development economics. And I wanted to question you about the poverty reduction um, issue that we, you talked about before, that you said that the minimum wage was not as important as Bolsa Familia. But I, I tend to disagree a bit with that, c because I do understand that regarding the labor market, that of course that's not that important for, for poverty decrease. But if you consider BPC, the disability... BPC? BPC and the um, pension system also, and also that this, the, the minimum wage is what, eight times larger than Bolsa Familia, the amount of money that gives, probably like BPC? seven. No, the, the minimum wage compared to Bolsa Familia. <coughs> eight times uh, the, the value yeah. of BPC is a minimum wage is approximately eight values the average mm -hmm. Bolsa Familia, yeah. Right? So I think it, it does have an important, a mm. very important impact on, on okay. poverty. And okay, let's get there. Uh, minimum wage and negotiations. In the, uh, it's a reference. But of course, when you have a negotiation in different uh, areas, you can take minimum wage uh, as a reference. But of course, the negotiations, depending on the sector, are much, uh, the, the, the basic values are much higher than minimum wage. Money. It depends. It depends. In the industry, manufacturing industry, in Sao Paulo, for instance, uh, the basic payment negotiated in, the, in, the, in that syndicate uh, uh, will be much higher than minimum wage. But minimum wage is a reference, in mainly for the, 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 those people less organized in, in sectors with the lower productivity and so on, in the traditional areas. And from the point of view of consumption, of, uh, I, I talked already and I mentioned that uh, I, uh, it was very important and it is very important, not only because of labor market, but also because of the pensions. And the pensions, there are millions, I mentioned some figures, millions of people receiving one million, uh, one minimum wage. She just mentioned the BPC, that's uh, uh, another program for poor and hand for handicapped people and there are more four million people receiving a minimum. In this sense, of course, minimum wage is, is important for poverty, in this sense. Because if you do not receive a B, uh, a B, the BPC, for instance, you are in a poor family, all of a sudden you have the right, since you, you, you live in a poor family, very poor one, uh, with uh, average, uh, average revenue below one-fourth of a minimum wage, that means very low value, uh, you have the right to receive minimum wage. And th at this moment, you are not poor anymore. So it's a real change for uh, these people. Okay, and, and I agree, of course. 
and uh, but uh, usually the, the papers we have been developing in Brazil, they they uh, they estimate the relationship between minimum wage and income distribution, and all people uh, uh, agree. Most people, practically all people that work on this subject, agree that uh, minimum wage is much more related to income distribution than to poverty. But I agree completely that uh, in cases like this one, okay. either receiving zero or receive one minimum wage because you are poor, you are not poor anymore, so you have uh, okay. an important. Okay, okay you Joe. want to talk. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a very comprehensive debate. Thank you also to you two for bringing this new issue and to the crowd to bring all these questions. It's very timely to have you at two days of the election, even if we have no action on the result yeah, of very going to vote. I will be very quick on my question because, I mean, at least some of them have been already attacked. First is uh, that the minimum wage is, uh, has been installed in 1940. And all the discussion has shown the centrality of minimum wage in Brazil, including what has been said just now on poverty, on pension, and all that. So the question is on the political situation now in Brazil, is it an open issue to suppress minimum wage or not? And it, something which goes like that, I mean, it means it's not marginal, but some political force are advocating or not. It seems to me that's not bad. And the comparison with other countries is also very important, especially Argentina. So I support this one. This was my first question. Second question I had was sectoral dimension, which has been raised and is important. Is important. Um, uh, you, you mentioned industry. What is going on in agriculture is also important in the sense of that uh, evil man is also said to be the man of the agro-business. Maybe in the agro-business they are against, I don't know. By the way, I, show, uh, I saw in the figure you saw that uh, the centrality of the minimum wage is such that uh, it, is, it fully impacts the wages, for example, of the military forces. It's, it's not... I mean, the, the, the figure for the military forces, you will see, is of the less than this one. Civil and military, you know, it, is not so, it does not decline as the other one in the corner. You see? Up. Which one? Uh, civil and military servants. Yeah. It means, no, but it, does, it has a meaning. Everyone gets a, it's the so same. central an institution that all the captain, lieutenant. They the same. They, yeah. they, 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 they feel it's part of the, it's really part, uh, it's, it's the centrality of this institution. This is very striking, very welcome. Uh, by the way, I, it's much more complex to understand how it plays with self-employed. Yeah. It's uh, complex, the rational sure. for that, you have to find that. It's a very complex working of informal and self-employed oh. and all that, but that's a bit, a bit difficult. So it's very interesting in that respect, and it, it makes a comparison with Argentina, which has a long-term uh, 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 history also uh, interesting to see if we have the same. Uh, another issue which has not been touched, and I was surprised because I know that they have a lot of lessons and seminars on that, is the impact of financialization. We need to see what is the share of profit in all that how it's going on in all that. It's a, one, it's, a, it's a crucial thing. And I hope they will have questions on that. And last and all, it's uh, the demographic pressure. Because at some point, I was very surprised that it was indexed. The centrality of this minimum wage was indexed simply on GDP and not GDP per head. Yeah. So how it uh, articulates. And all the more so that this demographic pressure has to be seen as well in terms of a growing urbanization. There is a question of violence in Brazil, which is pushing middle class to support this evil man 
in a way. So is it part of the demography or of the youth unemployment, the fact that the youth mainly are unemployed in turn on that? The floor is yours. And thank you all for <laughs> this comprehensive debate on Brazil. Good. A country we love. But we fear. Okay, suppress so minimum wage, no question about it. No, no, no one. No one. No one. Okay. The question is what, what and if make a change in the law? For instance, why pay, uh, GDP uh, and not GDP per capita? It would make more sense, GDP per capita, because in some sense it's a productivity. But uh, when the people negotiated, they said, no, we want GDP, GDP. It was a long negotiation among uh, politicians, uh, workers, the central, worker central. And so people ask for GDP. GDP means more <laughs> than GDP per capita. So this was a decision favorable to minimum wage, but suppress no question. Agriculture, I don't have much to talk about agriculture. I, I can say that agriculture in Brazil has changed a lot uh, from the family, family agriculture to the big, big ones, but uh, I don't have much information about and how important the minimum wage would be for agriculture. <coughs> Military and civil, Workers, you know, it's a, it's a decision, it's an internal decision, it's a government decision how to make, which, which increase to give or not to give. For instance, my case, I think I don't have increased in the last three years. I am a civil servant, yeah? and no increase, because the government decides not to give increase because of the crisis. Okay, no, what can I do? But this, this is just to, to, to mention that it's a, an internal decision in the diff either in the central government, in the local government, uh, is, a, is, is, a, is a special, it's not the market. <coughs> the relation between a minimum wage and self-employed people, I agree with you. I, I don't know exactly how to explain why we, 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 you have those uh, uh, s uh, Elasticities. Okay, people that make less money, in some sense, their revenue is more related to minimum wage. That's what uh, it means. But uh, economically, it's not that easy to, to, to understand the relationship. Demographic pressure. We don't have any demographic pressure in Brazil anymore. The population is increases uh, le less than one percent. So this is not the point. These are, these are no 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 question. Of course, uh, Brazil is urban. The urban population is is increasing <coughs> more than the rural one. But the urban population is already 80 percent. So there is not much increase there. But uh, it's not a a big question anymore, no. The population will stabilize in, in a few years. We have to, we talk about, we have 200 million people in Brazil. For the last 20 years, we have 200, uh, 200 million people in Brazil. Now we have 206 million people in Brazil. And maybe we'll get to 210 million, <coughs> and that's it, because women do not have that many kids anymore. So. The, there is no, no possibility. I don't know if there is an important point uh, that, that I missed that you, you mentioned. Financialization. <laughs> no, fin fi financialization. No profit. Is, this is all over the world. It's not uh, just uh, a Brazilian yeah, no, no, question. No, no, no. But <coughs> you, you can and indirectly see this in the question of uh, uh, income distribution when you look at the functional income distribution. One part of the, of the profits come from the, the finance sector. And there is a discussion in Brazil that maybe you, you, you worked with Lena Lavinas. Mm -hmm. 
And she says that even with the, those uh, social programs, the government is, uh, facilitates those people to have an account, a bank account, and to get some. If you have a Bolsa Família, receive Bolsa Família, you have the right to have a, an, a bank account and to get some credit because you have an income. So this is one, s one side of financialization. Yeah, financialization is growing, definitely. Would but uh, uh, people... Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so uh, I want to once again to thank uh, Professor Sabaya for...